This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Well, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Turo, uh, could you please state your full name for the record and spell your last name? Scott Turo, T-U-R-O-W. Now, do I get to interject something here? Already? Already. Um, I, uh, I don't think I've been to Hastings before, but uh, when I applied to law school in, uh, in 1975, I applied to eight law schools, and uh, this is the only one I didn't get into. So I'm, I'm very pleased to finally make it through the doors. Well, I, uh, I certainly hope you don't bear any ill will from that. Uh, where, did you, uh, where did you grow up, Chicago? I grew up in Chicago. I was born and raised in the city of Chicago until I was uh, 13 years old and then my parents moved to the suburbs and I reluctantly followed them there. Okay, well, I'm going to start off with a, a very heavy question which is in many of your books uh, there are what I would refer to as derogatory statements about a uh, baseball team called the Trappers. Now I understand you're a fiction writer and your characters are composites, they're not real people. Uh, but is it not true, Mr. Turo, <laughs> that the Trappers are the Chicago Cubs? Well, they certainly in their utter haplessness bear a very close resemblance. <laughs> okay, so if you would permit me to ask a hypothetical question, and since you have no counsel representing you, you really can't object. Um, I've never seen that stop a lawyer on the witness stand before. Uh, that, that's actually true. <laughs> that's a true. Okay, so here's the hypothetical. Uh, the Cubs have just won the seventh game of the World Series, beating the New York Yankees in Wrigley Field in, with a ninth inning walk-off home run that sails out onto Waveland Avenue. What is the first sentence that goes into your journal, or I don't know if you keep a journal or a diary or anything like that, but if you did, what would the first sentence be? That's really easy. I wish my dad had seen this. That's a, that's a great answer. You, you hit a home run with that answer. You, um, you've said that you wanted to be a novelist since you were very young, 11, 12 right. years old, something like that. And uh, you went to Stanford in uh, the late 1960s. I w arrived at Stanford in the fall of 1970. Oh, in, in fall of 1970. Right, as a writing fellow in the Stegner Creative Writing Program. Okay, yeah, that's right. You had gone to Amherst College. I was an undergraduate right. in Amherst. And, and uh, that's where I met Charlie Ferguson, who's sitting in the front row. Well, yes. oh, there's a shout out. Um, what, what would you say were the most important things you learned in your time at Stanford? Well, one of the most important was um, not to be afraid to call myself a writer. And, uh, you know, for young people uh, who want to do something in the arts in particular, uh, there's sort of a, um, a sense of being daunted by the sheer presumptuousness of it. And uh, one of the great things about the writing program at Stanford, and there are frankly many, uh, but one of, the, one of the great things is that they gather uh, a number of very talented young writers and sharing their company and realizing that they had, you know, similar dreams, 
uh, sort of makes you feel less odd and more courageous. So that was certainly you know, one of the most important things I gained um, through those years. The other, frankly, is that uh, we, we, because we use language every hour of our waking lives, uh, people like to believe that you know, they can be a novelist uh, almost automatically. And you know, of course, that's not true. If you said you were going to be you know, a concert pianist, uh, without, uh, without any practice, people would laugh at you. Well, now I'm going to interject because I, I don't know whether it was an interview that I read with or, or saw, uh, maybe with Charlie Rose, but uh, it was with regard to 1L. When 1L came out, you said a bunch of your classmates came yeah. up to you and said, well, I wish I'd had that idea. Yeah. And you, you, you fairly bristled at that, I didn't you? I certainly did. I certainly did because, you know, one of the important parts of Stanford in my life was it gave me five years, uh, whereas I, my friend Tom Ziegel from that, those days says, you get to log a lot of pages. And uh, I had really paid my dues in terms of learning a writer's craft. And so it was sort of emblematic of the smugness of Harvard Law School, and uh, <laughs> that, that my classmates were all sitting there reading this, you know, frankly, uh, dream of a review by Christopher Lehmanhaupt, and they're all going, oh, I wish I'd thought of that, you know, as if, <laughs> as if that's all, you know, right. that's all that was involved was just thinking of that. Um, anything else that you learned there, uh, in particular? Uh, I, I don't want to get too deep onto this, but um, you know, the observation has been made or the opinion has been given that lawyers don't write very well and in particular that law students, graduating law students don't, aren't prepared to write when they, I mean, at least firms complain about yeah. that. Firms complain, well, the law schools don't do a good job of teaching students to write. Is there anything that you picked up from the writing program that was, that's generic enough to impart to legal writing? Is there, is there, is there anything that, 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 you, that we should remember? Most of, um, I, I mean, the phenomenon of law students not writing very well, frankly, goes to the nature of uh, American education. And the fact is that students in grade school and high school and college don't write very much. So, um, but the, 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 the greatest lessons that I learned that are, um, that are really translatable to being a lawyer did not come from the writing program at Stanford, but from our undergraduate years at Amherst, where uh, there was an immense attention to writing and to the preciousness of every word. And uh, do we have time to tell a story? Please. Um, the chairman of the English department at Amherst was uh, a, a man named Theodore Baird, and Baird would walk into his um, freshman uh, English class, and he would walk up to the first young man, and he would say, crusty New Englander, what is it? And uh, the student would say, it's, it's a pencil professor. And Baird would hit him across the head with it. And uh, he would then go to the second student and say, what is it? And the student would say, well, it's a slender yellow object. And Baird would hit him across the head with it. And he would go all the way around the room repeating those antics with you know, chemical, um, you know, physical descriptions, whatever he got. And he would stand there and say, it's a weapon. And uh, <laughs> you know, and the and the point, of course, was that your perception can be controlled by a single word, and uh, it, w it was a you know it was a great lesson that that stood all of us in good stead, um, not only you know as writers but lawyers or whatever else we chose to do. I'll have to try that one sometime. Um, I recommend you start at home. <laughs> <laughs>
After uh, you concluded your time as a fellow at Stanford, um, you had a choice to make. Yeah. Um, it was a choice between a tenure track position in the English department at the University of Rochester. True. Versus an offer of admission to the first year class at the Harvard Law School. Right. Not at Hastings, but at Not Harvard Hastings. Law School. Not at Hastings. Because after all, we, we have standards. Right. Um, <laughs> but my question is, you'd wanted to be a writer since you were, you wanted to be a novelist since you were 11 or 12. Yeah. And that never left you. Right. And so now you're faced with a tenure track position in the English department, right. the literature department, right. versus being a first year law student, right. and you want to be a writer, right. and you pick being a first year law student. Now, right. how do you explain that? Um, at length. Um, <laughs> first of all, uh, my time at Stanford, although of immense value to me, had, uh, had been frustrating, and frustrating mostly um, because I suffered from something that I call the writer's disease, which means that I was having a very hard time building borders in my brain uh, between what I was writing and the rest of my life. And so I was obsessing, and uh, it wasn't comfortable to me. Uh, over and above the fact that you know what I had written had not, I'd written a novel over four years and couldn't sell it. Um, it really was that problem more than anything else uh, that was bothering me. And I knew I needed something that was really involving to sort of pull me out of myself. Hmm. Um, and the thing that I discovered quite inadvertently by writing about a rent strike in this novel was the law. And uh, I, this was a great shock to me that the law was uh, so interesting to me. I'd sort of ridiculed my roommates, most of whom had marched off to, to law school yeah. when I graduated from college. And, well, how did your father feel about it? Your father was a physician, wasn't he? My dad he? was a doctor. And, he, and didn't, he didn't really care for lawyers, did he, he? My dad was a prophet in his own time. He hated lawyers long before most doctors did. And, uh, <laughs> but because he was like that, uh, I didn't know any lawyers. There was a guy across the street who sort of was an exception to my father's rule. Uh, but in general, my dad lived in this sort of kind of emotional wilderness, and he just you know, he cared about his patients. He was a doctor, as we've said, and uh, and that was all that you know. That's all that mattered. And you know, you take care of your patients. You come home. You're with your family. He just didn't get lawyers and all their rules. It was a way of thinking that was alien to him. So, you, so you're going to law school in a way to kind of get out of your own head. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And it worked, by the way. It turned out to be, for me, a well, great decision. It, 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 it helped your writing. It, it, I it, un, it kind of unblocked you. In a, in I a always way. say going to law school was the great break of my literary career. <laughs> and it's true. Well, entering the Harvard Law School, you already had a contract to, to write, write 1L. 1L. Right. Is that correct? True. Yeah. Um, another anecdote. Another anecdote. Um, one of the things that 1L seems to, su to suggest, um, and that is to say, those of us who read it, and I was one of those, probably everybody in this room read it before they went to law school, I did too, um, and it's been a while, but my impression reading it, and I've shared, and this impression is shared by a number of other people, is that it's almost like the professors were conspiring to make students miserable, to put them under pressure, like, you know, calling on the same student the same day. Like, that couldn't be coincidence, could it? The professors had to be, you know, they were getting together in the faculty lounge or in the restrooms or something, and they were, and they were figuring out, who are we going to torture today? I mean, that, that's kind of what comes across in 1L. Mike, and I guess my question is, number one, is that really the way you felt? And number two, 
if, if you did feel that way at the time, do you still think that now? Well, I, I never thought that the faculty was trying to gang up uh, on the students, although I do think that there's kind of an inevitable um, mechanism, especially in those days, for the faculty to say, well, I went through it, they should too. Uh, it served me well, I like who I am, I like the lawyer I became, so uh, this will be good for them. Uh, but, you know, not all of my professors, and they're not represented in 1L as being uh, harsh. Um, a lot of them were, you know, very, um, were, were very kindly. But I do think that there is a point of commonality. I mean, uh, I entered Harvard Law School in 1975. So it's 35 years plus, and people are still reading this book. And there have been lots of changes in legal education. Um, and yet people keep reading it. And I often say, why? And I think one thing that 1L probably gets uh, at is the vulnerability and the sort of shifting sense of identity that all law students and probably all professional students have yep. as they enter, as they come through you know, these doors. And uh, so, uh, it, you know, I, I've often said that, you know, 1L is the diary of an unabashed neurotic. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and my own stuff obviously played a large part yeah. uh, in, the, in the book and the, in my experiences as a law student. But did I feel that bewildered and vulnerable and sometimes trashed? Yeah, yeah. I did. Yeah, but looking back on it now, you can see that I, I, I don't think I felt at the time that anybody was trying to do me in, but I was okay, just, yeah. I was overwhelmed by how smart my classmates were. Um, you know, they were really, really smart. And it's not like I hadn't been around smart uh, people, smart people yeah. but you know, there was a kind of aggressive edge that lawyers have uh, that m most of these people had, and it just came spontaneously. They could solve these problems with a speed that I never had any hope to match, uh, you know, and then there were these Olympian figures in the front of the classroom. It was very easy mm. to feel sort of humiliated by the whole thing. After graduating Harvard, uh, you became an assistant U.S. attorney. I did. In uh, the Northern District of Illinois. And you spent, what, seven or eight years there? Eight years. Like eight yeah. years. Um, and during that time, you wrote a book that would significantly change an entire genre of literature, the so-called legal thriller. Yeah, and one life, it changed one life, too. Yeah, and that book, of course, was presumed innocent. Now, I've never been an assistant U.S. attorney, uh, but I know a few, and I'm not under the impression that they have a lot of spare time. Um, and so how was it that you wrote a runaway bestseller, Moonlighting? Well, I mean, there are two parts to that. One is when I made the decision to go to law school, I took this solemn vow that I would not allow myself to go silent as a writer. It had been my dream, and I was not going to relinquish it. So I wrote every morning uh, on the commuter train on the way to work. I had that 23, 25-minute period to write. And there's kind of an object lesson there for the people here who want to write, which is that even 20 minutes a day is way better than nothing, and it keeps the gears oiled uh, and the story in your head. Uh, the other thing, and I have to give credit where credit is due, my ex-wife uh, always felt that she had been the victim of a fraud in the sense that she had married a writer and ended up with a lawyer. and. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, you know, in fairness to Annette, she always encouraged me to write, and uh, it was her idea that I take a summer away from the law between the U.S. Attorney's Office and entering private practice and finish this book that I'd been dragging around in, uh, in my briefcase. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's fair to say that without, uh, without her encouragement, I wouldn't have done it. Well, let's talk about your dragging this book around. Um, 
Is it true that there was a point during those eight years where you had to put the book down Absolutely. because you had to figure out the plot? Right. You, yeah. so, so how does that work? I mean, you, you, you actually, so you actually wrote half this, but let's say the first half of this book, first something like that. 20 pages. Okay, so you printed. were, so, I mean, but Carolyn Polemus is dead. She's dead. She's dead. And that much we know. That much we knew, but, but you're telling us here today that she was dead and you had no idea who killed her. No, I had no idea who killed her. I just, I mean, I, I didn't know what I was doing when I started. Um, and, uh, you know, I wrote that prologue um, after I had started, although very early on. Um, what I was doing, though, was sort of um, finding a way to animate uh, what was going on inside me every day in the incredibly um, you know, tumultuous emotional world that everybody who works in the criminal justice system experiences. And uh, I had been briefly a, uh, an, an intern, a clerk in the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office, the Boston DA's office, and I had seen this case tried that has a superficial resemblance mm -hmm, to the murder mm -hmm. um, in, uh, in Presumed Innocent, although the woman killed in, in that real case was a prostitute. Uh, but, um, you know, and so I had, I didn't want to write about the U.S. Attorney's Office. I'd kind of learned my lesson writing 1L, where I'd basically been chased off the Harvard Law School campus <laughs> by angry faculty. And uh, so I didn't want to write about the U.S. Attorney's Office, so I set it in, you know, something that closely resembled the Suffolk County DA's office. And I started, and it seemed to be going pretty well, and I, you know, I found this voice, uh, which was inspired by somebody I'd known in, in Boston, and it, you know, but then, you know, it turns out that, you know, novel has got to have a plot. And, uh, and uh, I reached a point where, uh, for anybody who remembers Presumed Innocent in detail, I'm probably the only person in the room who does. But I highly doubt that. But um, Raymond Horgan, the prosecutor, has assigned Rusty Savage to investigate uh, Carol and Polemus's murder. There's a, uh, reaches into his drawer uh, the DA's drawer and pulls out a file that has been missing from Carolyn's, uh, from Carolyn's drawers that Rusty, in fact, has been searching for. And he's dumbfounded. What is the, what is the DA, or as he's called in my books, PA, prosecuting attorney? What is he doing with this file? Mm -hmm. And I didn't know the answer to that. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, I got to stop and figure this stuff out. So I took, uh, I took two years away from the book. Well, I, I, now I heard you say in a previous interview that... I hope what I said is some, consistent. I, <laughs> well, I'm not trying to impeach you here. Um, I heard you say that there was a point in the book, I don't know if it was 120 pages or whether it was the file or where, where but there was a point at which you realized that you had, and this is my phrase, not yours, but that you had essentially painted yourself into a corner and that there were only two people. Oh, that was later on. That oh, that was later on. That took place during the two years that I was thinking about. Okay, so. And I did not realize when I put the book aside that I had painted myself into a corner. <laughs> two years later, when I'd been thinking about it all and going through all the possibilities, that um, I realized that based on what I had written, that thus far, the 120 pages, that I was stuck. There were only two people who could have committed that murder, despite right. the fact that I had created a large cast of potential suspects. Yes. Uh, but I knew what had been said thus far. Right. And the crime had been created. And of course, the logical thing to say is, uh, well, why, why didn't you think about going back and changing it if you wanted somebody else to be the murderer? And I find this one of the most um, amazing things about the creative process, which is you got to have a place to begin. And once you've begun, uh, you don't want to give up the starting point. And so I was not willing to go back and rethink the, 
120 pages. I wanted to keep them. That was the universe I'd created. It was going to have to have uh, internally consistent rules, and so it could only be one of two people. So it was going to be Rusty or it was going to be Barbara? Correct. How did you pick Barbara? Well, you know, the, the originally I wrote the end of presumed innocent in the first draft without saying who had committed the murder. And Rusty gives this incredibly uh, ambiguous speech, and as does Barbara. You mean in a draft that we don't see? It, well, you know, the, the, the truth, of course, is that a large part of this is preserved in the, in the novel. Um, but it was really Barbara's speech that left a large question as whether it was, it was, sh it was she or it was he mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who had um, committed the murder. And then Rusty's later uh, conversation with Lepranzer, the detective, can be read either way. And at that point, and, and my justification for not saying was, well, you know, I've been a prosecutor for eight years. I've walked out of criminal courtrooms often mm -hmm. not knowing what really happened. Yeah. And uh, sometimes, hopefully, most of the time, I knew the defendant was guilty, uh, and so did the, and the jury agreed. But as to what really had occurred beyond that, I was often baffled. So I thought that, well, that was a fair representation of the criminal uh, criminal justice system, and I realized at that point uh, that you know that's not why people read mm -hmm. literature, and certainly not why they read uh, mysteries. They they want to know uh, what the motives were and what happened. Uh, well, it's I, almost like breaking your contract with the reader, right? In a way. That, that, yeah. That's that's what readers expect. Yeah. Now, um, because innocent is still so recent, um, I, I feel that we, uh, well, we, we, we can't give away the ending. We hope not. We, we will not give away the ending. Uh, but we can talk about certain aspects of it, I hope. Um, and so for those of you who have not read it, and I do highly recommend it, um, Tommy Molto's character gets developed yeah. much more fully than he does in any of the previous books. Right. Is that a fair statement? True. Um, I mean, I, I hesitate to say that he's a cardboard cutout before then, but he's certainly kind of a, a caricature, you know, more than a character right. uh, up until up Tommy until. Tommy slowly is crawled out from his own shadow um, in uh, in the earlier books, but it is definitely the case that you know he's still a sort of uh, fanatical. Uh, bachelor law robot, and uh, well, he's not a bachelor anymore. He's not, and that's that's one of the changes. Yeah, in innocent. He's yeah. no longer a bachelor, and no longer the sort of um, intense, somewhat restricted person that he was in the first, in, yeah, in the first few novels in which he appeared. So, I guess what I want to ask is, um, how do you feel now about Tommy? I mean, I, I would say in the early, in the earlier books, my guess would have been that you, you weren't terribly sympathetic to him. I mean, he was he was sort of a pathetic character right. in a way. Right. But but pathetic and sympathetic are right. two different things, right. and it didn't seem that the author was particularly sympathetic right. to him. Whereas this book. He gets such a full, he becomes a full human being. I mean, you see his marriage, you see his love for his child and his child-to-be. You see even, even though, you know, Jim Brand is really kind of a son of a bitch uh, in a really kind of just a human pit bull, he's loyal to Tommy and Tommy is loyal back and there's a genuine relationship there. And so I guess my question is, how do you feel about Tommy? Do you feel differently about Tommy Molto today than you did 20 years ago? Could you, could you be friends with him? Well, y yes, I feel differently about Tommy today than I did 20 years ago. Um, oddly, I started to see Tommy a diff in a different light when I was writing that book, The Laws of Our Fathers, and near the end, uh, 
near the end of, uh, of that book in which Tommy, you know, plays the Hamilton Burger role uh, again, <laughs> uh, you know, and is, is not successful in court, he gives um, <clears throat> a, a fairly impassioned speech to the judge who presided over the trial um, in which he basically says, I knew I was being manipulated by my bosses, but I didn't care. I believe in the law. Mm -hmm. They sent me up here to do this, and I, I did it anyway. And uh, at that point, he began to uh, enlarge in my mind. And uh, I started to s think about him differently. Uh, he, grew, I, he grew on you. Yeah, he grew, and he grew up. and. Um, but you know, it, 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 it bears saying that you know, one of the points in Innocent is that Tommy is not the same person that he was 22 years before. And, uh, None of us are. But he's meant to be a kind of uh, double ganger for, for Rusty. Uh, because Tommy, mostly through circumstance, but part, partly through strength, has had the willingness to change his life. and. Uh, and, and that stands in contrast to Rusty. Other than Molto, um, I would say no, nobody else really comes off that well in, in Innocent. Um, I mean, Rusty's a two-time uh, uh, philanderer. Anna's a homewrecker. Uh, uh, Nat's a neurotic. Um, Barbara certainly isn't portrayed in a very flattering light. Uh, and as I say, Brand is basically a, you know, he's a hack, he's a human pit bull. Um, and even the previously sainted Sandy Stern, you recall, loses his halo when he goes off in open court that one day and right. brings up Tommy's right. admission. Right. Very unfairly and very, right. very cruelly, really, uh, brings up Tommy's admission that he had tampered with evidence right. in, in the Polemus trial. So here's the question. Have your views about human nature changed in the last, uh, <laughs> in the last 30 years since you started writing novels? I mean, I, let me just go through some of that. I mean, Rob, Robbie Fever, the PI lawyer right. in personal injuries, right. ends up... I, I mean, he starts off an unsympathetic character, but he ends up right. coming off pretty well. Right. Uh, David Dubin in Ordinary Heroes right. certainly comes off well. But do you think there's anyone other than Tommy Molto who comes off well and innocent? Well, I, I mean, everybody can, you know, choose their own wine. Um, am I empathetic to Rusty? Yes. Um, greatly. <clears throat> Do I think his behavior is a model um, for, you know, what I'd like to follow myself? No. Uh, but I admire his honesty about himself um, and his willingness to acknowledge his own mistakes. Um, so, you know, and I like both Nat and Anna a great deal. Um, you know, I, I don't think, and one of the, you know, w one of the hallmarks of my novels is that uh, nobody is, uh, nobody's a hero all the time in those books. You talk about the sainted Sandy Stern, but if you go back and read the end of Presumed Innocent, uh, Rusty makes quite, quite a point at the end of the book that uh, his lawyer was basically manipulating the judge because he knew he'd been involved in illegal behavior years before. And Rusty's so angry, the sort of uh, perfectionist that he is, that he got, uh, he got dismissed out uh, as the result of this court sort of underhanded chicanery, that he doesn't talk to Sandy Stern for more than a year. I forgot about that. At the, at the end of the book. So, um, you know, I don't think there's anybody in any of my novels who's ever really had a halo. Um, and, you know, I, I have the view that we all get out of bed every morning and we struggle to be uh, the people whom we would like to be and know we should be, and most of the time we succeed, and every now and then we fail. And, you know, if, if we fail 
uh, in most cases we don't do great harm, uh, but sometimes we do. Uh, sometimes it's harm within the context of, you know, the people we love, um, and uh, you know, some, and sometimes yeah. it's it's in the context that that happens to be dealt with by the criminal law. But uh, you know, at the age of 61 with three kids. Uh, you know, I look back and I go, you know, why in the hell did I do that? You know, I didn't, you know, I just, the stuff you come to understand later about your own life um, yeah. really informs the, the vision in the novels. Let me give you a true-false true question. Um, okay. You have, you have sort of a funny, your, your novels have sort of a funny, what I would call a funny relationship to the law. I mean, one could argue that you revere the law and its institutions pretty deeply, but you find the people who actually carry it out to be just really deeply, deeply flawed. True or false? I would say the way you've put it, false. False, okay. Um, what would make it true? I, well, I certainly, I, I do revere the institutions of the law. Uh, I always say that the law, as Sandy Stern said in Burden of Proof, the law is about the little bit uh, of life that human beings can actually control. And, um, and I think that's, that is a noble struggle to try to rationalize to some small extent uh, our existence. Um, I, I, but I don't find uh, the people who practice law uh, repellent. I enjoy being among lawyers and I don't think the lawyers in my novels are, are all slugs. Um, you know, they, uh, I, I tend to think of them as you know, deep and sometimes very decent uh, people. Uh, fair enough. Fair enough. You once admitted to Charlie Rose that, um, and I have to say with a fair amount of relish, it seemed um, that you like to pull the rug out from under your readers. Yeah, that's true. So again, without giving it away, I felt like you pulled the rug out from under us in Innocent. And then as we staggered back to our feet, we found ourselves on yet another rug that then gets pulled out from under us again. So I guess my question is, were you trying to out Tarot Tarot? I mean, were you trying to, were you, try, were you trying to, to, to outdo presumed innocent? I mean, it, it, do you think, I'm asking you to psychoanalyze yourself here, of course, but do you think there was something in your head that said, because you said, had said earlier that you, know, you, you, know, you feel like you don't want to compete against yourself, right. but then you're into it and you're finishing there, the book's almost done now, and now do you feel like I am competing with myself and, and this one's going to be better, this one is going to be even more of a thriller? I didn't, I didn't want to have it be that kind of a race uh, or a competition. But, you know, I, I am deeply grateful for the legacy of Presumed Innocent in my life. And I didn't want to be seen as sort of, you know, engaged in grave robbing. Uh, and I was just sort of plundering the reputation uh, of, the, of the prior book. I, I wanted to write. Um, what by my lights was a really good book uh, and one that you know by calling itself a sequel mm -hmm. um, certainly had to um, offer some of the same you know defiance of expectations that, that Presumed Innocent had so um, now when you wrote Presumed Innocent you weren't thinking of a sequel no, I didn't think of a, I refused to write a sequel, because um, talk about being painted into a corner. Um, I was, you know, I'd spent 20 years trying to write fiction. All of a sudden, I've written this mammothly successful novel, and the world's out there, and people are beating down the door saying, do it again. And, you know, I was like, why would I do it again? I've got this chance to sort of spread my wings as a writer and find out what I can do. 
you know, why would I write another novel about Rusty Savage, which, if it was successful, would very soon have me, you know, in the fate of writing, you know, a series of Rusty Savage novels. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm more interested in, in, you know, different people. Um, and I didn't want to live, as it were, inside the skin of, of only one yeah. character. Yeah. Well, you said that you, uh, it gave you an opportunity to spread your wings, and that's what you wanted to do. There were, there were some intervening books. Um, the Burden of Proof came, mm -hmm. ca came next. But um, the book that you have said publicly is the, the one that you're proudest of is, is this one, The Laws of mm -hmm. Our Fathers. Mm -hmm. Do you stand by that statement? Well, I don't know when I said that. Um, you know, I... I I've been actually pretty pleased with um, with innocent and with ordinary heroes, and also with personal injuries. Um, and you know, I like all of those novels a lot. But you know, the truth is, you pick up every book you've written. There's something about it you really like, uh, and there's something about it uh, that you see was a mistake. In terms of the laws of our fathers, I thought it was a very ambitious book, at least for me. It, you know, went back and tried to make sense of the 1960s um, and, and uh, was hard for me to write. Um, you know, it's the, it's the book that I dedicated to my kids. Um, and I do pick it up and read it with an enormous amount of pleasure. I really do. Um, I like just about everything in it. Well, I, I have to say, um, well, uh, now this was, was this the first book, because uh, Presumed Innocent was written in the first person present tense. Right. Was this the first book in which you wrote with multiple narrators? Yes. Yes, okay. Because uh, I have to say, when I, because I had seen you, because I'd heard you say, you know, well, this was the book that I'm proudest of. And so I thought, well, I have to read it. And I looked at it and went yeah. to the end and I said, oh, my God, yeah. it's 800 pages. Right. Um, I never did understand that decision to, to print the thing as if it was a doorstop. <laughs> <laughs> the novel, it, I mean, the hardback was not a lot bigger than my other books, but... Well, what I was going to say is that my personal experience was that by page, by page 60, so by page 60 of this book, I will admit to you, I wanted to quit. Oh, sure. Because there were so many characters, there were so many narrators, there were so many themes, there, were, there was a main plot that was kind of a nominal main plot, then there were some really important subplots, uh, there were background themes. And by the time I'd gotten to page four, I don't know, 450, 460, 470, I couldn't put it down. And I, and I will say that even by page whatever it is, 780 or 800, when all the plots and all the subplots have been exhausted, they've all been tied up, there's two eulogies mm -hmm. at the end of this book, if you recall for Seth Weissman's father, mm -hmm. one given by Seth, mm -hmm. and, the other, and the other given by, uh, by, by Hobie Tuttle. Seth's lifelong best Seth's friend. Seth's li lifelong, a brilliant African-American uh, uh, lawyer, I mean, somebody who had been with Seth and Sonny and right. the Edgars <laughs> back in, here in San Francisco. Back in the day. Back right. in the day. And um, even though all the plots were done, I mean, the, the, the book was done, really. And there are these two eulogies that had me absolutely riveted. And by the time I put the book down, I was convinced that I had read one, this had been one of the best books that I have had, had ever read by, by anybody. So I, now I'm, I'm going to blub, I could blubber on about. You're about, doing fine yeah, I'm doing so fine, far. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? Nobody out there cares about what I think about the book. What they want to know is why you think it. So you've said it, it took on the 60s, which it certainly did. Right. Um, 
it, but it took on so much more than that. It took on racial injustice in America, took on the failure of the criminal justice system to do anything about that racial injustice. It took on, it took on the theme of growing older, mm -hmm. of, of, gener of generational change. There's like this sense that, uh, you know, when, you're, when we're young, we're idealistic, we're gonna rage against the machine, we're gonna change the world, we're gonna make it all right. And then we wake up one day and you know, we got a mortgage, and we got a kid, kids to put through college, and uh, and then suddenly we wonder, am I part of the problem now instead of part of the solution? And I felt that this book was a very ambitious and largely successful attempt to confront the way that we deal with those feelings. I mean, can you talk about that a little bit? Well, um, one of the things about the laws of our fathers that I'm proud of is that it did take on the 60s. Um, and if you think about it, there has not been very much writing uh, or film that's sort of gone into the, the teeth of the 1960s, the, uh, the sort of... Um, immense sense of disturbance that everybody in American society felt. Um, by, the way, by the way, I've been very curious about this. Damon, is that like a composite of Berkeley and Palo Alto? Obviously. Yeah, okay, all right. Obviously so. Yeah. Um, composites are easier to deal with. Oh, you know? fine. I'm just choose, curious. Choose the, yeah. choose the best aspects of yeah, each. Yeah, just, just curious. Um, and you know, I still see the 60s, which is really the period that um, went from probably like 1963 through Nixon's reelection in 1972, um, as the most formative period in American life, not simply in my life, but in American life, hmm. um, in, in, in my time on Earth. And, um, you know, our notions of, of racial justice, of gender justice, of the role of, uh, of authority um, changed in ways that, that you know, I, one of the most great difficulties of, of writing The Laws of Our Fathers was trying to explain to younger people what that world, the world of the 1950s had been like because you know, you can't get anybody to take it seriously <laughs> because it's so different. I mean, that, this, that really was, you know, the, the, the period when America thought outside the box. And generally, you know, the opinion about the 60s these days is that it was this massively self-indulgent period. And I see that as a pose to avoid um, the sort of spirit of rebellion and the questions that were asked then. Uh, and so I saw uh, these people who were willing uh, to think differently about themselves and about the society as being uh, sometimes misguided but basically heroic. And the issue that they faced is, you know, how do they, how do they merge into the world that they in part created and that in part disappoints them. Uh, and, you know, to me that's what, that's what the book was about. But, uh, you know, I think the 60s, it's not a popular opinion, left uh, this country and most Western societies much better, much better than they were before. Out of... Uh Sounds like you're not completely alone. That's it. Yeah. yeah. You, if you can't get away with that in the Bay Area, you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Try that in Little Rock. Um, <laughs> out of all the characters in all your books, who's your favorite? Hmm. 
seems like you like Sonny Klonsky a lot. I do. I love Sonny. Um, I haven't lived with her for a while, so I, uh, it's hard to, it's, it's really hard to remember. There, I, I, you know, I'm fond of, of a lot of my characters. I mean, Sonny was somebody who I really felt, you know, an enormous amount of kinship with. Uh, but, I, you know, I have to admit that having returned to Rusty, um, I, I feel a lot of attachment for him, for him too. But it, you know, that, you would never choose just one. You know, it would be like saying, you know, who's your favorite child? Um, you, you don't want to. You don't want to do Sophie's Choice, huh? I. I don't have to. You don't, you have, <laughs> that's that's true enough. In the um, in the early '90s, you were approached to represent um, a man named Alex Hernandez. I was. A man who had been convicted, along with Rolando Cruz. Uh, of sexual assault, uh, sexually assaulting and then murdering 10-year-old Janine uh, Nicarico. Nicarico, Nicar yeah. Nicario? Nicarico. Nicarico, thank you. Now, Hernandez was sentenced to death despite the absence of any physical evidence. Uh, there were only the statements of the accused. Um, and what you characterized as a contradictory maze of mutual accusations and demonstrable falsehoods from various informants and cops. And of course, I'm quoting now from his book, Ultimate Punishment, A Lawyer's Reflections on Dealing with the Death Penalty. Um, Hernandez's conviction was reversed. Both of them were. Yes. They, and they were con reversed because the prosecutors had deliberately used each other's statements against the co-defendants without, of course, allowing for any opportunity for cross-examination because they tried them together. Then on retrial, the, uh, for uh, Her Hernandez's retrial, first retrial, the jury hung. Hung. But the third jury convicted. convicted him. Now, he was no longer on death row. He was sentenced but to 80 years. 80 years in prison. With the judge giving a sentencing oration that basically said, there isn't any evidence in this case. I don't understand how this jury did what it did. I'm going to sentence him to 80 years instead of death. And uh, I want to read a. Uh, uh, a passage from, uh, from the book. Uh, this is page six of Ultimate Punishment. The lawyers begged me to read the brief that Larry Marshall, a renowned professor of criminal law at Northwestern University, now Stanford, had filed in behalf of Cruz and to look at the transcripts of Hernandez's trials. By the time I had done this, six weeks later, I knew I had to take the case or stop calling myself a lawyer. Alex Hernandez was innocent. In fact, a man named Brian Dugan had confessed that the victim was one of three females that he had murdered by similar methods. Correct. But you met with enormous resistance. Huh. That's an understatement. From the DuPage County prosecutors who attempted for a decade right. to debunk Dugan's confession. Right. You finally managed to secure the dismissal of charges in late 1995 right. after Cruz was acquitted in his third trial. Correct. What did you take away from this experience? Well, obviously it was an eye-opening uh, experience for me because uh, what I really experienced reading the transcripts in particular of Alex's trial was that the justice that I knew um, in the U.S. Attorney's Office did not bear any resemblance 
to what had happened to these two men in DuPage County, Illinois. And, uh, you know, I had sat with uh, my friend Jeremy Margolis, who had been the chief of the Illinois State Police, and told me I had to take this case. Uh, and I just looked at him, I said, I don't, I don't believe you can convict two innocent men twice uh, in the United States of America. I just don't believe it could happen. And of course, once I read the briefs and the, and the transcripts, I realized, well, I was assuming that the prosecutors didn't cheat, uh, that the judges were calling balls and strikes fairly. Um, but once you take respect for the law out of the equation, you can convict innocent people dozens of times. And uh, it, it, it was a revelation that even with, even in a case where there was tremendous attention, uh, that, that, that people could be either so cowardly, um, especially the judges, frankly, um, or duplicitous, as some of the prosecutors were. No. And uh, it, it, you know, was really disheartening and it was, but you know, Cruz and Hernandez was the, uh, an early example of a phenomenon we've come to see across the United States, which is that um, prosecutors have a very, very, very hard time accepting the fact that they have convicted the wrong people. And eventually I began to think about this with uh, more understanding and less outrage. Um, you know, if, if you get up every morning and you're a prosecutor, um, you're making less money uh, than many of your law school classmates, uh, but you're, you're doing the right thing. You're bringing justice to your community, mm -hmm. you're putting bad guys away, you're making the world a little bit safer. And to suddenly realize that um, you have become, um, you know, a sort of unwitting would-be murderer instead, strikes at everything that you've been doing for years. And so uh, the first reaction is, this isn't possible. It's more of the usual crap that I get from defense lawyers. Um, and I understood that, but the 10 to 12 years that this fraud was perpetuated on this poor family, um, it was just, it's very disheartening to contemplate. But as I said, it happens in a lot of places. And, uh, you know, the most... And, and this case, and your involvement in this case made you realize that. Yeah. For the first time. What way for the first time. I didn't believe it. In 2000, uh, then Illinois Governor George Ryan, um, who I believe was a pretty staunch supporter of the death penalty when he started, Yes. I mean, George Ryan's a fascinating person. We could talk all night about him, but uh, he's, there's a very simple part to the man. And uh, he voted for the death penalty when it was reinstituted in Illinois in 1977. Uh, and he never really thought about it again until he became governor. But then he had to sign death warrants. Right. And he became troubled. He was really troubled. And the irony, of course, is that the, the one case where he signed a death warrant was for a man who really was a monster, serial murderer of another number of women in really grotesque ways. Uh, but every time he asked a question about the case, uh, he was, he became uncomfortable. He would say, well, you know, how, how do I know for sure this guy is guilty? And they'd say, well, he confessed. And he'd say, well, tell me about the confession. And they'd, they'd say, well, he was chained to a bed for 17 hours uh, before he confessed. And he'd say, well, okay, but, you know, the police who took that confession, they were, they, they were, they, they were okay, weren't they? And, you know, the person yeah. he was talking to sort of paused and said, well, no, they were the cops who were involved in Cruz and Hernandez. And the governor just couldn't make himself comfortable with this case, even though everybody around him was telling him, 
you know, this guy's guilty, he's a bad guy. If you're going to have a death penalty, this is the kind of person yeah. that you're going to execute. Yeah. He signed the death warrant, and he basically came away from it saying, I don't ever want to do that again. And he declared a moratorium. He declared a moratorium on executions. And around that same time, he created a blue ribbon commission to study the reform Correct. of capital punishment. And you were one of the 14 people that he turned right. to to serve on this commission. Now, in Ultimate Punishment, you refer to yourself going in as a quote-unquote death penalty agnostic. Can you explain what that means? Well, I, I always say that um, I don't criticize anybody's opinion about the death penalty because I've held them all. And, um, you know, I had just sort of gotten to the point where I felt bewildered by it, as, as I think many Americans do. I felt, you know, in the face of certain crimes, this, this massive retributive anger, uh, but it just it didn't seem right to me that a benevolent and self-respecting state would execute any one of its citizens. Um, I just I couldn't I couldn't get my arms around it, and so I just would say I don't really know if I believe in this or not. Well, I, you don't believe that taking a life for a life is necessarily morally wrong in all cases. No, I don't. So you would not agree then with the opponents of the death penalty who argue that it is cruel and unusual under all circumstances. I mean, Justice Brennan took that position, Justice Marshall, Justice Blackman eventually. You don't think that there's a moral prohibition on the state taking the life of somebody who has deliberately killed somebody else. Well, allow me to be a lawyer for a second. Okay, uh, and, fair and, enough. And, and slice the baloney. Um, <laughs> what, Thank you. What, what, I, what I really felt was that um, that position of taking a life for a life in certain circumstances <clears throat> was a moral position that had a strong foundation in Western thought. It was not, and it was facetious to pretend that that, that way of thinking was somehow alien to Western thought or unworthy. Um, that was one of the things that I never managed to get straight about in my own conscience. Um, and I always took to heart the words of Sister Helen Prejean, who said, you know, you think the death penalty is such a great idea, you go down there and, and press the button. Um, and thinking about it in those terms, I really didn't know whether I thought the death penalty was moral or not. But I knew I wasn't going to condemn it on moral grounds. So if you don't condemn it on moral grounds, then um, there has to be the justification um, for banning it has to be something else. It, it, it has to be on policy grounds. It has to be because the costs aren't worth it. Uh, now, let's turn to deterrence. Yeah. There's a huge debate about whether the death penalty deters. And you look at some of the research, uh, and it tends to be, I think, I don't know if I'll, this is my take on it, is that, you know, the, the people who are opposed to the death penalty do this, do the research, and they find that there's no deterrent effect whatsoever. And in fact, there maybe is a brutalizing effect, which causes yeah, murders are. to actually go up. And then you have research that's funded by pro-death penalty right. people, and they say, oh, no, no, we can tell you that, that for every convicted murderer that we execute, we save 18.7 innocent lives, or 28.3 right. right. innocent right. lives. Right. So you've got a hopeless 
kind of mishmash right. of empirical evidence about deterrence. Well, <clears throat> I don't think most people understand what where the complication and the deterrence arguments have come from. Um, the, and that was the intrusion of free market economists into this debate. And you say, well, what in the world would economists care about this? And the answer is they would care everything because the premise on which they have based their lives, sort of like the prosecutors and based their lives, is that uh, we are all ra rational social actors who respond to incentives. Mm -hmm. And so if the incentive of saying, I'm going to kill you, doesn't change social behavior, then they have put their eggs in the wrong basket. And so, um, you know, the, and of course there's been great evolution in, in economic thought in the yeah. last 35, 40 years. Yeah. But the initial reaction was, oh, this can't be, it, it's got to be a deterrent. And so we got all these econometric studies that were done, the work of Isaac Ehrlich in particular. And then the Supreme Court took what I thought um, was a not admirable position, which is to say, well, we've read the studies, we've read the attacks on the studies, but you know, that's for the legislatures to decide. My own view of this is that if you're really going to use deterrence as a rationale, then you have to do it on the same basis on which the punishment is imposed, which is you've got to be sure beyond a reasonable doubt that, that it does in fact save lives. If it does, we ought to have a death penalty. That case, uh, frankly, n not only has it never been made to my satisfaction, I think most of the evidence looked at in a clear-eyed way is to the contrary. Just to choose the most obvious example, my home state of Illinois. Uh, Governor Ryan declared a moratorium in 2000. The murder rate in Illinois has dropped, not unfailingly, but yep. consistently yep. since then. So that we had like 900 murders in the state in 1999 and about uh, 725 last year. Now, if the death penalty is a deterrent and there's a moratorium on executions in the state, what could possibly explain that result? Now, you'll find economists who will try to multivariate analysis yeah, to say, well, maybe they'll there were other factors, right, yeah, maybe it would be even right, lower if you right. had a death penalty. But if you look at it in, you know, in a, just in a common sense way, um, the, the statistics aren't there, and if you represent these young men, and they're almost all yeah. young men, yeah. um, you know, the reality is most people who commit murders in this country are young, impoverished men who have lived a futureless existence. Uh, they do not understand the idea of consequences. Uh, and if, if that were not the case, the, the reality, of course, is that whether you're talking about white collar crime or murder on the street, all criminals commit crimes in the grip of the fantasy that they're not going to get caught. Right. So right. deterrence is beside the point. They're not going to be deterred because they don't think they're going to get caught. They're not going to suffer the consequences. Well, certainly, to go back to the laws of our fathers and, you know, the opening scenes, you know, the, I, I don't know if that's Cabrini Green or not that you're describing. Uh, it's, but it's, it's, it's Robert Taylor Holmes. It's, but. Yeah, I mean, it's, but it's, it's, a housing, it's a housing project that's been taken over by rival gangs and there's just, you know, routine uh, drive-by shootings and, you know, I mean, life is very cheap there. And, uh, you know, that's a perfect example of how certainly not everybody, I mean, maybe at the margin, some people, maybe, maybe hit men might be deterred in some way if you make, you know, if they're sure enough that they're going to get caught or could get caught, but in any event. Well, if you uh, convince yeah, anybody that they're going to get, get caught, caught, then right. you're, you're talking about a whole different psychology. Yeah. Don't opponents of the death penalty, though, face a, um, a difficult problem down the line, one that they don't really want to confront, and that is that with the exception, with one major exception, all the arguments against the death penalty are also arguments against life without possibility of parole. And the one exception, of course, is irreversibility. But 
if you got somebody who'd been in prison for 45 years and it turns out that they were unjustly convicted, well, good thing we got them out on time. You know, I mean, well, you know, they've lost 45 years of their life. I mean, how much, how different is that really from Ask wrongfully them. executing? Ask them. You know, one of the amazing things about being on death row is you look around and here these people are living in these eight by eight cages. Um, they are, uh, of course, they're single celled on death row since uh, somebody who's sentenced to death doesn't, generally speaking, make a reliable roommate. Um, and, uh, but they're still, you know, the community, the company they keep is the, literally the worst people in the society, uh, many of whom scare, to, scare even the murderers to death. Um, and you say, well, do you really want to live here? And any time I've done it, they've all looked at me and said, yeah, man, I want to. Now, do they think they're going to get out? Is that, yeah, that's what they think. Sooner or later, the door is going to swing open. But, I mean, one of the things I thought about a lot um, was how deeply we want to live. Um, and that's true for the defendant and, of course, it's equally true for the person the defendant killed. Uh, murder is a horrible crime. It, um, it, it, it is unlike anything else. Um, and, uh, and I think one thing that anti-death penalty advocates have to face up to is that fact. This, yeah. is, this is a unique and uniquely horrible crime involving uh, a total absence of any kind of empathy. For another human being, such that if it were widespread, would obviously destroy all civilization. Well, and in fact, the will, the, the incredible will to live, is something that you bring up when you talk about concentration camp survivors. The unbelievable torture and oppression that they went through and still struggled to live through it, and many, not enough of them, but some of them survived and become characters in your books, and of course their characters are ever defined by that. When you get asked the question, why do you keep practicing law? And you get asked it a lot. Um, because obviously you're, you're okay financially. Um, you, don't, you don't need the prestige of sun and shine. You don't need the office. You, don't, you certainly don't need the but money. The health insurance. You know. The health insurance, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Your inevitable answer to this question, because I've seen you asked it a number of times, is if it ain't broke, don't fix yeah. it. What, what does that mean? Well, it means that if these number, novels have tumbled out of me um, in a way that satisfies me with me continuing to practice law part-time, then why would I want to give it up? Uh, because you could write more of them. Well, that's true, but I really enjoy my involvement in the law in a really profound way. I mean, I, I took my mark well when I decided to go to law school. I, I still find the law incredibly interesting. And, uh, you know, just as an example, um, I've been writing for the New York Times Magazine about the mayoral race in Chicago, and by whatever irony, the pivotal event, I think, as it will turn out, it will turn out to have been the legal proceedings to throw Rahm Emanuel off the mayoral ballot. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just, I mean, the only thing that really matters to the readers of the New York Times is the result. But I read these cases, the briefs, I was just fascinated by it. I needed to understand it. Uh, I became, you know, really interested in seeing which way it was going to go. Uh, I understood the arguments on both sides. And, uh, but, you know, I, it's just I can't explain why I can become so preoccupied by legal issues, but I do.
I still do. So uh, to, just to be clear on this, the answer is not, I keep practicing law because I need material. No. For my books, that's you can, not. You've you got get plenty me, of material. Well, you can get material out of reading the newspaper. Yeah, frankly. Yeah. The answer is, I keep practicing law because I love practicing law. Yeah. I, I. I really. I mean, there are plenty of things about practicing law I don't like. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't like yeah. deadlines. I don't like difficult clients, and I particularly don't like difficult opponents. Um, <laughs> yeah. Not. Not many people do. Um, and it makes it easier that most of your practice now is pro bono. Oh. But, I mean, but, if, you, if, you, if you had 80% paying clients, you might not love the practice of law. Well, if you, if, frankly, one of the things I learned is that, you know, if you, if, if, if I don't overcommit so that I've still got time to write <clears throat> most of the time, uh, I don't become resentful. And, you know, I... I I mean, I have, I'm now the president of the Authors Guild. Uh, I was the chairman of the State Ethics Commission before that. So I don't practice very much at all right now. Mm -hmm. um, I have a you know, couple of cases that I'm involved with. The most involving case is a paying case, representing a physician who has been charged with a negligent homicide, and I think quite unfairly. So you're saying it's it's okay for the client to pay. It's just it's it's just interesting. It's just if, if the if the issue is interesting, if the practice is interesting enough, and that the cause is just enough, you 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 won't take it on. Well, you know, I um, obviously I made the decision in 1990 um, that you know that I was going to practice part time and that m more of that time was going to be spent on pro bono matters. And uh, a lot of that had to do with the stuff that circulates through the laws of our fathers. And um, as somebody who had been involved um, as a 16-year-old uh, in the civil rights movement and who, you know, white people were basically kicked out after the death of Dr. Martin Luther King, I was shocked uh, when cases began to bring me down uh, you know, to Robert Taylor Holmes mm -hmm. uh, and to see the incredible gulf uh, that had grown up between the lives of the average white American and the average poor, Amer poor Chicago in any way. And uh, because I was looking at a world where in many ways things were a lot better for the African Americans I was seeing at work, whether I'm talking about my colleagues mm -hmm. or the... Mm -hmm. Uh, or the people who were working in the loop, and I didn't realize that you know this separate world had been created, which which you captured. So in, I, I thought yeah, it was very important, yeah. you know, speaking of the '60s, yeah. that I sort of keep those commitments uh, and try to do what I could um, to represent the people who really needed to be represented which is the poorest people in the society. So the loss of our fathers, in a way, is you're keeping your promise to yourself that you weren't going to lose touch with the 60s. In many ways, yes. I want to ask you about ancient history and, uh, and the future. First, you, I think you've said that uh, you've got a number of unpublished novels sitting in your desk from your pre-presumed yeah. uh, presumed innocent days. Uh, is, is that's true? That there's, there's like three or four of them there? That, that is all true. Okay. Uh, any, any chance we'll ever see any of them? You wouldn't want to. <laughs> They're not. Um, there's a reason they weren't published. The last one, the one I wrote at Stanford called The Way Things Are, is, is not a bad book. It was publishable, um, but... You uh, don't think Grand Central would be interested in publishing it if you offered it to them? Uh, they might, but, you know, the author would not want to embarrass himself uh, or take advantage of my publishers. So I, I don't, 
I mean, it's... Do you ever think about going back and uh, cleaning them up so that they become publishable, or are they beyond... Well, there's about, a, about six pages from that Stanford book that's in The Laws of Our Fathers. But that's about all I found worthy of extraction. So... Um, Okay. You know, uh, the, I mean, I, I'm not saying that what I wrote um, before I got struck by lightning was unworthy. Um, you know, I published some decent short stories. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I, I knew when I was writing Presumed Innocent what the difference was. Mm -hmm. I, I knew that, you know, I had finally gotten into my own veins. Well, on the flip side, in terms of the future, you have mentioned a couple of possible projects. One is a science fiction novel. Yeah. Is that right? Did you? Yeah. I, I think I read somewhere that you had promised your son. I did. That someday you would write a science fiction novel. I did. You going to make good on that? Well. I thought a lot about it in the last year, and I've made some notes, and, uh, you know, I may do it, but... Um, so is it going to be like a courtroom in outer space or something? I do think about the future of the law, and I do think that's a pretty relevant thing. And the, the premise of this novel is that... Um, we reach the point that with recidivist criminals, instead of imprisoning them, uh, we change their brain chemistry. Uh, and so a father finds out that um, his son, from whom he's been estranged, is about to get the needle uh, and uh, sets out to, as it were, at least investigate and hopefully rescue his son. But to to rescue his son from the chemical reprogramming right, of his right, brain. Right, right. And, so, but the, and the, um, but I don't think that that assumption uh, is wrong. Uh, I think that we will get to that point. You mean you don't think In other words, that I do that's think far fetched? That, you no, don't think that no, the I idea of reprogramming people's brains think, chemically think we'll is, get is far fetched? <laughs> Certainly better than executing them. Well, your, your son actually does, your, your son who lives here in San Francisco actually does do work in neuroscience. He has, yeah. So has he taught you a lot about neuroscience? Um, I'm smiling because uh, my son knows a great deal more about uh, neuroscience than I do, but uh, the neurologist with whom I've been sharing my life the last couple of years does point out that sometimes his knowledge is not quite as deep as he thinks it is, so. <laughs> I see, so you have, uh, you have technical advisors uh, yeah. on this neuroscience yeah. thing, yeah. and they're both uh, pretty close to you, and right. so you're, you're in a rather I, I will uh, precarious say, position as far as right. uh, the technical Gabe stuff is concerned. Gabe knows a lot. He really does know a lot about neuroscience, and um, and so uh, it, it could be that he, he may be one of the technical advisors on a sci-fi book that you once promised him you would write. Could happen. Could happen. Um, the other project that I was thinking of was, uh, you, you mentioned on Charlie Rose, uh, I think it was last time you were on Charlie. Yeah, this, this guy's been on Charlie Rose like, eight times, so um, yeah, I think it was the last time. Um, you mentioned that you had a post-it, and is that the way you get your ideas, or the way you, I mean, that you have post-its stuck on your desk with story ideas on them? Well, that's, that's certainly where Innocent came from. Okay. Um, but I, I think you mentioned to him that you had a post-it currently on your desk that says, you don't love me. Yeah. And there's a line from the end of Innocent, um, and I'm paraphrasing it because I don't remember exactly, but you say something like, that's 
what all failed marriages come down to right. is you don't love me enough. Right. So anything to report on that front? I mean, is that, is that one going anywhere? Well, I started a play um, and uh, it, it just wasn't coming to life in the way I wanted it to. It was and that was, that was the you don't love me. Yeah, it was meant, yeah. to, be, it was meant yeah. to be a comedy. Um, and as I said, you know, said to you in your office that the, the nature of the concept was such that it really required, you know, somebody like Neil Simon, you know, who could deliver a zinger, um, you know, every minute. And uh, so I, I could go back to it. Um, but it, it, it wasn't going to, but it was never going to be a novel. No, it was not meant to be a novel. Now that, you know, the novel that I've started working on now will, is still going to take off from that thought. But how, how much can you tell us about, uh, just among friends here, <laughs> how, how, how much can you tell us about, about the one you're working on now? Um, well, I can tell you that it's about a politician. Um, it's about a decades-old murder. Um, that's about all. You're setting up the rug again. Well, right now the person who I would pull that out from under is myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, What's the question? Uh, I'm going to ask you to reflect on this for a moment, even though we have something like 30 seconds left. Um, what is the question that you most wish you would get asked? Because you do a lot of interviews. You do a lot of interviews. So what's the question that you most wish that you would get asked that you almost never do get asked? Well, that's only one step better than what's the question you most dread being asked. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, what is, uh, you could tell us the answer to both of those. Yeah, no, well, I, I, I certainly won't indulge the latter. Um, I, you know, I don't know the answer, um, probably not to either question, but, um, you know, I, I, I do enjoy this kind of back and forth. And uh, it's obviously Im immensely flattering to have um, a really capable person spend as much time scrutinizing my work and life as you have. Uh, I, but I don't, I really don't think, Evan, you've left, I don't think you've left many stones unturned, so. You, you don't think I've left anything on the table? No, I don't, I don't think you have to worry about having missed the, the question I wish the, I was the asked. One, that one question, yeah. God, I, I should have asked him. Well, you know what, I have enjoyed it as well. Scott Turo, thank you so thank much you for coming. Much.